We are now going to be moving uh, to our last session of the afternoon. And of course, perhaps more than any sector, uh, travel has been hit, as we all know, extraordinarily hard by this crisis. So our last session of the afternoon explores how the pandemic may have changed the face of travel for good, what it will take for the sector to recover and how the UK travel industry might look in the future. Now, addressing all of these questions, we have our panel of industry leaders. So please welcome Stephen Freudman, Chairman of ITT, Kirsten Hughes, UK Managing Director and Chief Commercial Officer of Travel Councillors, and Julia Lobu Said, Chief Executive of the Advantage Travel Partnership. So today's session is focused all about what now for the UK travel industry. We've heard this afternoon about the challenges of the quarantine measures, just how tough it is for travel agents at the moment from the heroes of the high street themselves, uh, John and Irene Hayes. And I wanna focus now on what now for the UK travel industry as we emerge from this pandemic, hopefully in, in the months, weeks, hopefully to come, um, and how you three believe as leaders of the travel industry uh, that the sector might change as a result of the pandemic. So we'd like to kick today's uh, discussion off with each of you offering a key example of how you think the travel industry might have been changed for good as a result of the last few weeks. And maybe you think any change is short-lived and maybe there is no, you know, maybe you think we actually were just going to go back to how we were before. Or have it, has, has the sector changed irrevocably? Um, I don't know who wants to kick this off. Stephen, do you want to begin? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist and I've seen so many uh, crises um, in fairness, nothing quite as bad as this, but uh, seen a lot of crises in our uh, in our industry over the 50 years that I've been in the industry. Um, and I'm an optimist, and I genuinely think that um, we will go back more or less to what we were. Um, I think that uh, I would like to think within a couple of years, at least, maybe maybe earlier. Certainly, it depends on testing, it depends on vaccines, it depends on uh, other elements. But I genuinely think that uh, people have short memories um, and our desire to travel will over, overcome everything. So I actually think that uh, we will go back more or less to what we, uh, what we were earlier this year. Okay, Julia, do you agree with that or do you think the sector has changed? Um, I, I think the sector has changed. I think, um, I think holidays will remain a really key part of um, our diaries. So I, I don't, in the future, I'm obviously not this year, but I think definitely in the future, I think our expectations of holidays will, will increase because we're coming out of a, uh, an experience, which is, you know, something we've never experienced before. You know, we have at the minute, you know, two months of lockdown. Um, we've missed that interaction. We've missed that ability to be able to, um, you know, meet friends and family. Um, so the, the desire to want to be together, um, and holiday together, I think, will increase. Um, and I think our expectations of a holidays being able to be able to travel in a manner that gives us that confidence yeah. that we will be safe um, is going to be really important. I, I was thinking um, just briefly. I was thinking before about the um, the security measures pre COVID, going through security when when the liquid when we were um, stopped when it was stopped when we weren't able to bring um, liquids in our handbags sorry in our hand luggage yeah. um, and I remember when that came in I mean a number of years ago now but that was a real you know a, that was a real issue for us and the extra security measures were a real issue but actually soon became normal so I think as consumers will will get used to what that norm looks like um, but our expectations of what we want from our holidays and how we holiday um, I do think that that will change for, for the foreseeable future. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that point because I think the how we holiday concept is going to be really interesting. Um, Kirsten, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think I agree with both Julia and Stephen. I think people have short memories, and um, so I think they will become a new normal. Um, I think travel will bounce back. I think people will value holidays and time with family more. I think we'll see more multi generational um, travel. I think people will be more aware of cleanliness for a period of time. I think there will be a high expectation in the industry of what people are doing. But I think what has this impacted to the industry, or what, what, what would I like to see good that comes out of this is from an industry point of view, how money, is, how customer money is used, mm -hmm. because I think it's become very apparent in this, you know, it's one of the few products that people pay out for so far in advance and don't get the product. And that has put the whole industry in disarray. And also, I think if we look at the package travel regs, where the risk now sits and the responsibility, it has been unfair for some time that the people that are shouldering the risk are actually the, the people who are putting it together, not the person that provides the product. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping what does come out, it hasn't come out yet, 
but I'm hoping it's really um, raised to the service to the government, the amount of risk that consumer cash is used and how it's used and hopefully we'll see some new regulation over the next it won't happen quickly i don't think but we start the government starts looking at how customer money is used and regulation particularly with the airlines you know the airlines hold the majority of the risk yet they don't have to bond any of the risk yeah. um, and i think that personally is is completely unfair now none of them have gone um thankfully i don't want any, i don't want to see any of them go but it's not right that that risk sits with us as the distributor or the customer. And um, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, this pandemic will make the government um, look at legislation in terms of how customer money is used in the future in this industry, personally. That's what I would like to see. But I think you're right, customers will continue to travel with bounce back. We all want our holidays. It's important uh, mm. to us. So I think it will bounce back and quite quickly. Yeah, I, I agree with Kirsten. If I could just make the extra point that I think we also need to look for, as well as those financial points, which are very well made, Kirsten, uh, we need to look for international protocols. We need to make sure that airports are working to the same standards. We need to make sure that airlines are working to the same standards. We need to make sure that hotels have a, 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 a hygiene and a cleanliness system that we can all identify, that we can be sure and confident when we send our clients there that uh, that they are genuine and that uh, our clients will be well protected. So an international protocol across the industry in all those different sectors, I think is going to be called for. It's what would be nice, sorry, sorry, Sophie, what, what would be nice is to have one singular one, <laughs> rather mm. than, because at the moment, what we are finding, all the suppliers are doing their own. Yeah. Um, and it would it would be good to have a generalized stamp of approval that is wild, what we're globally known, as opposed to each hotel or, you know, Absolutely. as their own, that there is a um, a global level of cleanliness that everybody now yes. has to be to. Who, who would that be established by? You know, who would people feel comfortable, the travel industries across the world feel comfortable establishing it? Would it be the UN WTO? Is it? Who, who could? The, yeah, the, um, the HBAA, we, we endorsed it last week. They've, um, they've launched theirs. So theirs is an accreditation scheme, which exactly the, the comments that Kirsten and Stephen made to again provide common goals and common, common protocols across their hotels. So, um, I mean, I, I obviously would need to speak to, to Juliet who runs that, but I think something something like the HBA or, or, or similar where everyone signs up to those common, yes. common standards so that we can all understand exactly when we're selling travel, understand exactly what protocols they've signed up for. And it's, it's easy to communicate. And it needs to be recognised by consumers, doesn't it, of course? It needs to be a benchmark that consumers look for, and then other hotels will want it if they haven't yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Visit Britain has talked about creating this quality standard mark that they want to apply, right. certainly for hotels in the UK, but obviously they're not just UK specific, so that's the challenge. Yeah. That but genuine, it has to mean something. It has to be enforceable in a sense. It, I, I would like to see you know, local authorities taking responsibility for this. So there is some sort of genuine accountability and uh, some uh, material offence if, uh, if people seem to be... Uh, seem to be cheating so that mm. the customers can have real confidence in this system. On this issue of government perhaps uh, readdressing things like package travel regulations as we move out of this crisis, what, what makes you think really that, that they might do that given that they've been so <laughs> vague and, and not even bothering Nothing. to listen to the travel? Well, yeah, exactly. there's just been a blank space um, in terms of listening to the travel industry over the last few months, you know, that the industry has been waiting for these changes to pack up travel regulations, which most other European countries seem to have adopted. The fact that the UK government hasn't, are you... Are you yeah, I, 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 I mean, very, very, very briefly, all I would say on that to the government is either enforce the law or change it. But don't dither as you have been for months and months and months uh, and allow these airlines to get away with not refunding. You know, the law is quite clear, but they don't enforce it. So if you're not happy with the law, then change it. But clearly, uh, from the travel industry's point of view, it's been an embarrassment. Do you feel that travel has been represented well enough then in government? I mean, clearly we don't still have a dedicated tourism minister for the sector, so there's that lacking. Um, and ABTA has been obviously trying its hardest. I know there's a new alliance that's now been created, which I think advantage a part of, Julia, isn't that right? Yeah. What, what was the thinking behind creating this alliance? Is it because there's a, a frustration that government just isn't listening? I think, you know, so the, the coalition, which is um, a, a number of a number of um, bodies that have come together, is, is really there to kind of support what's happening already. So, in, and looking at just specific key areas. So, the, the key areas that we are really focused on is quarantine measures, 
um, and the SEO advice, the non-essential travel advice right now, they're the two topics that we, we believe, um, like many others, need to be addressed and it needs to be addressed properly. So it's, um, it's really about sharing a common voice. And, and I think what we found right now, and I, I think, you know, apps have done a great job and, and they, they keep, they keep doing what they're doing. Um, but there needs to be a bigger voice with clarity. I think our industry is so, it's so complex and to try and get the right messages out. So I think about kind of my, my own selfish space, you know, for me, it's the retail trade, you know, whether you're business or leisure, it's the retail trade. That's what, that's what I'm interested in from a travel agent's perspective. You know, when we talk about the industry, it's too diverse to bring everybody into that. So when we, well, our language doesn't reference what the individual components requirements are. And for all of us, yes, we've got some common goals. Quarantine FCO would affect all of us. Mm -hmm. But further down the chain, there are different impacts to us and different issues. So, um, you know, so what, what we're trying to do is make sure that from a, from, from my community's perspective, you know, it's really clear that when we talk about travel, it's about that space, not the whole industry, because we can't, we can't speak on behalf of, um, and I, I think just going on the point of the government, I think we are so complex. Um, and for whatever reason, the government think of travel and tourism as domestic, and that's clearly very important. They don't reference the outbound sector um, at all. And some of the comments that, you know, we, we keep hearing, just do not, just for some reason, just do not understand the economic importance that our sector brings and delivers. Um, and that's, I think that's a frustration that, or certainly that, that we feel, which is why we have joined forces with other industry bodies, such as ATO, HBAA, um, BTA, um, also an NSPAA to try and talk with a with a common voice and supportive of APSA and IATA and other measure, and other industry associations that are out there. Um, but just to make it really clear from our perspective, it's about travel agents, whether you're business or leisure, and the part we play in that in that ecosystem. And how is that going? Have you managed to have dialogue yet with with ministers? And are you getting the message across the government? Um, well, I think. You know, I think you just have to look around the industry who, who have got louder voices and, and, and is it working there? I'm not sure. I think all we can keep on doing is we obviously have written to, to, um, to the ministers and that's created a huge amount of public profile, as have others. Obviously, Red Savannah, what they've done, I think is phenomenal. And I think that's, that's got to be applauded. It, it helps us all, supports us all. Um, but we've just got to, we've just got to keep shouting. And I've, I've, you know, I encourage my members as well, you know, Advantage is a membership organisation, we're owned by the members. That's, all, that's why we do what we do um, and we, we all need to be shouting as loud as we can about the key issues that affect us all. Yeah, to, to Kirsten's point, as we move forward and move out of this uh, pandemic, consumer trust is going to be a big uh, factor here and there, you know, we've obviously seen a lot of the angry rhetoric across social media of how the industry has lost their trust, etc. Do you think that the, the industry has to totally reform to win back that consumer trust? Or do you think as we emerge from this, actually, people have short memories, everybody still wants to go on holiday, and actually, we don't need to worry about that, you know, it will just slip into how it was before. Or do you think, do you know what, this has shown that actually the sector isn't working, we have to think differently, maybe it's with trust accounts or whatever. Do you know what I, mean? I, I think what Kirsten said at the start in terms of trust account, I think raised a really good point. So I think that that certainly needs to look at, and many of us have trust facilities which are which our members and agents to use. Um, but I, you know, I, I personally believe for the independent sector, whether that's home working or, or not, or, or um, physical outlets, mm -hmm. um, have got a massive opportunity, and actually throughout this, have absolutely rose to the challenge and supported their customers and helped their customers. We're not faceless agents, we're human agents. I yeah. mean, um, that human interaction, um, our, our customers have been able to hold, get hold of our members. They don't ring off the phone, the, 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 the calls don't ring off the phone. So I think there's an even added opportunity and even more value for the independent agent to shine throughout this. Look, it is tough, it's not easy, but I do, I think they, they really can shine their, their way through this. Mm. But, but Julia, you must have been embarrassed and pre presumably you, Kirsten, as well, by, by the behaviour of some of the tour operators this time. Um, I mean, uh, we, we've all seen the press full of uh, stories about people not getting refunds. We know why, we know the difficulties, but it is nevertheless an embarrassment when which month after month are publishing lists of uh, failing tour operators and tour operators are just not refunding. And I think, uh, I, I think that does the industry 
no good whatsoever. I mean, I have a, a, a personal issue, for instance, my son is supposed to be going to Crete uh, with a, a school trip or with his sixth formers at the end of uh, June, and the large tour operator is still chasing him for his money. And it's wrong. It's absolutely outrageous. And I said, absolutely, you're not going to pay, Hugo. But they're still chasing him and they're still getting, and the staff of these big tour operators have got the script that still says what the head office is dictating. Yes, you must chase. And yes, the holiday, as far as we know, is going ahead. So the tour operators cancelling three weeks before when the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is clearly, uh, advice is clearly against all, all but essential travel is cynical and wrong. But Stephen, is that not the government though? I mean, I, I do, I, I completely agree. And actually, you know, our agents have had, have, um, you know, been, you know, have, have had upon them delivers a torrid of abuse on the back a of- A terrible the, time, I'm sure. You know, but, but actually I have to say, you know, that the government again, you know, have been so quiet on this matter. Yep. Have the, had they not have come out, and even now today, we're still waiting. So- the, the, Absolutely. You know, so actually as an industry we're we're sitting back and unable to kind of help ourselves because the government are so quiet on on the PTRs for example you know what on, on the credit credit no refunds you know all of that absolutely um, it's, agree it's been horrific it's an embarrassment they are dithering as I said earlier they either enforce the law or they change it what's okay, your point on this well I think I think there'll be winners and losers from this so far I think some way, the word unprecedented is the new word and has been the, the said word for the last three months. Um, you know, everybody was put in a difficult position at, at the time, everybody. And I think there's, there's been, from our point of view, I think the winners will be those that stay close to the customers. So there was obviously a, a defined difference between the people that had agents and those that didn't. Yeah. Those that on the high street that had to furlough and shut shops and, and those that didn't. Again, uh, we were in a very fortunate position. Our, our travel counsellors are accessible 24-7. Yeah. And I think even though you're delivering bad news to customers or that we can't get you refunding, we've not been able to refund everything immediately because we have been in the hands of some suppliers on that. Just by keeping your customer informed and being available and not shying away from it, your customer is reassured that they will get their money at some point. And mm. um, you know, we were fortunate. Um, we, we were just acknowledged a couple of weeks ago uh, in a survey in terms of doing it really well. It doesn't mean we've refunded faster than anybody else. It just means we've kept our customers informed mm. and, and they know we're fighting for them to get their refunds. So I think there'll be winners and losers. You know, the big online players aren't set up to deal with a crisis like this. They, they've, got, they've got technology that makes bookings really efficiently, but we all know unraveling a booking takes much longer than it does putting it together. Mm -hmm. And with that takes care, empathy, human emotion with the customers who are distressed. I don't think we were helped uh, by certain spokespeople said speaking for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, the likes of Martin Lewis and others, you know, the, the practical uh, thing was this was a pandemic and you know realistically refunding in 14 days the package travel regulations were like written for that 20 yeah. hours ago you yeah. know they, they, they've never they, nothing like this has ever happened and i think that didn't that certainly didn't help our cause um with it and i think and, and to julie's point i don't think the government are helping you know mm -hmm. this big great fco we don't know when there's an end in sight countries will have us but we're going to quarantine them I yeah. think time now comes, and I know we'll probably get onto this, that the, the FCO have to start giving us defined dates rather yeah. than, oh, tomorrow you can travel. You know, even Pritta today, she comes out and says, well, okay, it's going to be quarantined from the 8th, because I don't think we'll back down from that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I think they want to save face. Um, they've done it far too late. You know, actually, we should have done it three months ago, and now we're soft yeah. winding it down. Yeah. Um, so I think where we will get to is they will go ahead with it. But if they said, we're going to do it from the 8th, but on the 29th, we are going to have an air bridge to these five countries. Mm. Airlines, tour operators can start planning. And we've obviously got customers now. We're looking at all forward, forward bookings. We, we are our own tour operator as well. We are trying to be as flexible as we can with customers, but I think the crisis has now moved, Sophie, because we had chaos at the beginning, people stranded overseas getting them back, mm. a billion different policies changing every three hours from all the suppliers now to a refunding crisis which most people are now getting through to now as a tour operator or even an agent with retail tour operators is the well hotel might be open but the airlines are cancelled or the airlines cancelled on that particular day but they've got a flight tomorrow uh, it's going to take three months to get the refund but the 
this probably can still travel. So as a tour operator or an organiser now, we're in this funny position of we just need clarity. Yeah. Can we travel from the end of um, Ju July or mid-July or August or September? So people can make clear decisions then of do I pay the balance, do I not? Mm -hmm. Because People refusing the sad thing for customers because the balance collection is so far in advance. Mm. If they don't pay their balance, they breach. The tour operator can cancel and they've lost the deposit. Now, we have found good and bad tour operators. Mm. I think this crisis for us particularly have seen the winners and the losers in this. There will be suppliers we will deal with after this crisis is over and there will be definitely suppliers we will never deal with again after. I was going to ask about that. John and Irene Hayes uh, this afternoon pointed out exactly that, that there are certain suppliers that they're now reevaluating their relationship with going forward. And, and I was going to ask both of you, Kirsten and Julia. So please, from Kirsten, that's exactly oh, the thing for you. Tell, tell us who they are, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should probably not be so uh, crass to do that. But <laughs> I've had some pleasant surprises with suppliers that I thought would be problematic, who have been very efficient and got the stuff together very, very quickly, who I didn't think would. We've got those who are a voice of reason and doing their best considering the circumstances and will always be reasonable. And then there are those that are completely unreasonable as far as the customer is concerned. Um, and I know, you know, we, we, we based our business on relationships and how we treat a customer collectively. And um, I've been seriously disappointed by a handful of suppliers who've just turned the back on the customer, wow. um, taken the black and washed their hands from it. And, you know, if that's is true colours of a supplier, yeah. um, and ultimately customer is king, and they put us in a difficult position. We will we will do the right thing by the customer, but ultimately we will not we will not deal with those suppliers again. And uh, have you already told those suppliers that that's it now? Uh, I think they know. It's, oh, okay. <laughs> so we've not said because we we have a obligation to the customers and the travel that we've still got with those suppliers, yeah. but we won't be putting any new business. Um, with them in the future. And there's not many, I'm, I'm glad to say. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, it's been interesting. I think you see, I think for all of this, we see the good and the bad in people and, yeah. and the absolute best and the absolute worst. And uh, yeah, we have had some yeah. challenges. But it's been interesting. Julia, is it the same for you? Are there certain suppliers that you thought, you know what, we're going to reevaluate re our entire relationship with you going forward? Yeah, look, unfortunately, there, there are, and, and Kirsty summed it up perfectly, and we'd be no different. You know, I think we're all we're all taking pain and we're all going through very difficult times. So we 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 accept that there are um, challenges at every angle. Um, but you know, the customer has to come first and and you know how we treat them, how we service them, we can't forget that no matter what we're going through. And uh, unfortunately. Um, we've not had that service delivered from everybody. So yeah, look, we, we all have to look at who we deal with. Um, the relationships got us into business and they'll get us out of it and we'll, and we'll work very well and, and solid, it will solidify other relationships that possibly we didn't realise, um, you know, needed solidifying. But I think it will, you know, I, th I think it, the relationships are really important coming through it and they will change it undoubtedly. Yeah, so you see already from that, we're going to see a new travel landscape as we emerge from this, you know, and just in terms of the supplies that are being sold by certain consortia or, or big companies like yourselves. And um, also as, as an industry, we're, we're, we're innovative as an industry, we're very creative. And I, I think this will give rise and be opportunities for new supplies around that aren't, you know, maybe out there right now. Um, so mm -hmm. we're looking to understand actually who are the new kids on the block, who are, where are the products that maybe we hadn't kind of paid the attention to before? Um, what are the new products that our customers are going to want so we can start working them? And, we, and the team have already done that. So we've already put in place some new agreements, um, which is great and exciting. So it gives us something really exciting to talk about and something for our members to, to get their teeth into. We've already got new suppliers signed up as a result of, of the crisis. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Is that across the tour operator particular spectrum? You know, or is it cruise line and... And um, yeah, not not no. They're different products. We'll we'll be able to announce them soon. But they're they're different products that um, we haven't had on the portfolio before. But because the the uh, the interest probably hasn't been there, or the opportunity hasn't been there. So I think this is creating a new opportunity, and we, we've got to we've got to be creative with that. So um, yeah, so looking at the supplier portfolio, looking at the gaps, looking at where the consumers want to go for the rest of this year, because at some point we will be able to be able to travel. Um, and what does that look like? And we just want to make sure that we've got the products to supply to our members. Yeah. And on and on that, I mean, it's nice to see that there is an optimistic note. You know, there is there is light. It might just be a tiny pinprick, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. So let's just look at how things might change going forward. 
um, in terms of that? How might the booking process change? How might the travel industry itself change? Um, before we started recording, we were talking about networking as a massive part of, of the travel industry. How do we think networking is going to change going forward? Stephen, I know you're a massive proponent of still wanting it to be face to face, but Julia, you were saying you think maybe now it's going to be a little bit more about Zoom networking. Is that what you're suggesting? I think it will change. I, I really do. Look, we're all about people and this industry is about people and that will never change. But I personally think we have to be realistic that this way of life is 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 here for a little while longer. Um, mm -hmm. We all have to get get comfortable with um, re-engaging with people face to face. So and I think for a lot of us that, you know, we're still feeling quite uncomfortable and quite nervous about that. So I, I, I think networking, whether it's through Zoom, through, you know, face to face, it's going to come back, um, but I, I guess we just have to manage our expectations as to as to how our customers, our suppliers, our members are going to want to interact with us in future. Stephen, what are your thoughts on that? Face to face networking will come back as strongly <laughs> and as importantly as ever. I am a hundred percent certain. It's just a question of when. <laughs> you know, if if let's face it, if, if a vaccine is available in September, then the world will be almost normal. I would think by by the springtime. So. It's a question of when, uh, you know, human faith, human, uh, we, we, we need to network. There is a, there, there's a, there's a, a desire there and it, there always has been, always will be. Yeah. Well, what about the booking process? Because obviously, Kirsten, I mean, you're very lucky, like you said, with a home working business, you're perfectly well placed for, for a pandemic in that sense. But um, we're hearing a lot about Zoom. Um, lots of retail travel agents have been using Zoom, for instance, to make uh, bookings and, and get in touch with customers. I know Kirsten obviously traditionally has been the phone, but have, have your uh, members been using Zoom a little bit more? And, and Julia, do you think that that might now change the, the booking process going forward as well? Kirsten, we'll start with you. I think with our customers, you know, they've got very established relationships with our travel councillors and, and much of that probably done over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but again, each travel council is different. Um, some travel councillors, a lot of their customers would be local, they would meet them for a coffee, they'd discuss the, the, the needs and then they would probably email them. I think the consumer has probably become a bit more comfortable now with Zoom and um, interacting with family, for example, on, on this forum. You know, a year ago, my in-laws would never have done anything like this. You know, they picked up the phone and they saw you face to face. Now they've quite enjoyed it because it's the only way they've been able to interact. Yeah. So I, think, I think customers will be more receptive to this, but I still think we are human beings and I think we like people, we like seeing people, we like listening to people. Um, we like having a conversation on the phone. I think Zoom is great, but it has to be premeditated. I think you have to organise the time, which is fine. I think with customer interaction, you know, a surprise phone call or an interaction that isn't premeditated is tends to be a bit more personal. And this is great for business. I'm networking potentially in the BNI meetings. I know we know a lot of our BNI members um, have, have, have done Zoom meetings with 30, 40 people. I still think they're a bit cumbersome, personally, if you get more than 12, 15 people on them. Um, so I think they, they, they're doing a the job right now. I think a certain demographic loves it. Um, our customers probably are more on the personal, picking up the phone, coming and meet me for a coffee, having a chat rather than Zoom. So I don't think it'll transform, transform completely. I do think it will work for businesses. Um, I think running your businesses, Mm. Some customers will be more receptive. The younger generation probably much more receptive to it than the older yeah. um, generation. But it's what is, we are happy to do whatever the customer wants. If they want a Zoom or a Skype or a telephone call or a meet to me, it's it's the customer's preference. We have some staff that will not put the camera on when you get them um, at home. They're just uncomfortable uh -huh. with the whole one being on camera. And I think some customers are a bit like that. I mean, today I've had to put makeup on because I was coming on this. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't get me on camera every day uh, since I've been at home. So um, it depends on your state of attire and how early in the day the call is. So <laughs> I, I do think it's, it's, it's customer preference like um, yeah. Julie from Mila. Julie, what do you think? I mean, obviously you represent a, a huge number of retail members. So presumably you're going to be a passionate advocate for, for retail still, but do you think the booking oh. process might have changed in some ways? Yeah, so, so yeah, 100%. I think, you know, the high street's going to change and we've got to see how that evolves and what that looks like. But I think what, um, what this has actually done is I think it's created an opportunity for retail agents to also um, behave like home workers because I've had to. Yeah. So um, it's going to give person a bit of a run of money, I think, moving, moving forward. But um, 
But yeah, no, I, I think it's it's um, it's making retail agents think more dynamically and thinking more, more multi-channeled because they they've had no choice. They've been forced into this environment. It probably wasn't in their comfort zone um, because their comfort zone, I'm um, generalising, has, has been face to face. Mm. Um, but uh, moving forward, they are embracing technology like this, and they are embracing, um, you know, more telephone sales, which they've, they've had to do. So um, it will become more comfortable. So I, I don't, it won't overtake um, their their total business model, but it will definitely become an, an important part of it moving forward, and one that we will be helping them with as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the industry adapts to how society also adapts as, as we move forward. Yeah, but, but Kirsten says it, I think it's it's consumers that um, that determine how we adapt, mm. it's not us. I think we can be creative, innovative and, and demonstrate something different to the consumer, but it's the consumer ultimately that we service. So if they want to be on a Zoom call, if they want to be on a telephone call, if they want to meet in the shop, then it's the consumer that determines that and you know our members and, and home workers etc will, you know, will adapt accordingly really. Mm. And we, we, sorry, we also have to get government on side. It's a huge call at the moment, isn't it? You know, we have to get rid of the stupid quarantine business. We have to get rid of the FCO uh, advice. And we need to get a government that actually supports us. Uh, the, it's interesting, the, the French uh, government, uh, Edward Philippe, the Prime Minister of France, last week announced an £18 billion support package for travel and tourism. because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said that uh, when uh, the travel and tourism industry was doing well, then France was doing well. Mm. And I thought, wow, what a refreshing, are you listening, Boris, you know? Yeah. But take us seriously. We, 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 we employ four million people in this country. We're, we're, we're a massive industry. And we really, really do need to make our message heard loud and clear yeah. at West Coast. How, Stephen, how do we do that? You know, why doesn't the sector have a dedicated uh, minister? I think that John Penrose was our last dedicated tourism minister, and that was brought back in 2011. You know, what, yeah. what does the industry need to do to communicate? It, How it's, a very good, it's a very good question. Governments of all, of, of all hues have, have not taken us seriously. I, I, if I'm honest, I don't think we'll ever have a, a, a Minister of Tourism uh, as per se, because as Julia said earlier, our industry is so fragmented. When you talk uh, to politicians about tourism, they think only about domestic tourism, maybe a little bit about inbound tourism, but never about outbound tourism. So we, when we're talking to government, we have to talk to, to the DCMS, to the Department of uh, Business and Enterprise, to the Treasury, to the Home Office, to the Department of Transport. So it's, it's, it's crackers. Um, certainly we shouldn't stop calling for a, a, a Minister of Tourism, but, but I think it's an indication of the fact that none of the governments for the last 50 years, God help us, have ever understood travel and tourism because we had so many in the last, in the last 15 years, I was looking it up, we've had 18 Ministers of Tourism. Mm -hmm. you know, crackers. None of them can understand their portfolio, none of them. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's a real sort of, uh, and, and, and it's, the, uh, it's the most junior of all the posts that can be offered in the most junior of departments, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. They don't take us seriously, despite the fact, as I say, that uh, four million people are employed and uh, uh, there's a big risk at the moment, given what their, uh, what their policies are with yeah. quarantine and FCO advice. Big, big risk that they're going to end up with lots and lots of people out of jobs. And this, this point about quarantine uh, and FCO advice kind of brings me background full circle. So the title of today's seminar, of course, is Can Some of You Say? Um, I'd just like to see, to talk about whether, A, we, we can see signs of green shoots, you know, fine, it might not be that we see it next month. And certainly, although we've got the quarantine rules from Monday, you can't actually travel anywhere according to the FCO advice. So <laughs> that in itself is almost redundant. But do we think that summer could still be safe? Could we see bookings going into July? I know John and Irene Hayes said themselves that they started to see new bookings coming in and there's a definite rise and a definite increase. Hopefully people are sick of their four walls and they are starting and wanting to go on holiday. Um, Kirsten, uh, Julia, are you seeing that from members? And then Stephen as well, tell us what ITT members are, are seeing in that. Yeah. Uh, we have definitely seen some bookings for summer in the last couple of weeks, uh, late summer, admittedly, but August, uh, September. Uh, my personal view is there will be some travel this summer, if the government sees sense, um, sooner rather than later. Um, sadly for some regions, you know, in Scotland, their school holidays start much sooner, so it may be too late for them. Mm. I, I think the temptation will be the cost of travel this summer, because, you know, some of the holidays they could take this summer could be 30, 40, 50% cheaper than the same holiday this time last year. So 
I think the the people that are incentivized on price, um, we may fit, we may see a late market. Um, now, it will depend on the government, but we've got we have got some time. We are we are only at the beginning of the month. If they do do some bridges at the end of um, June, our school holidays start mid July. We have got to the end of August, so. I do think we will see some. Um, it might get a bit of a bloodbath, but I do think we will see. I, I do believe we'll see some summer. I think you've, you've got two customers: those that don't want to come out of the houses, even when they'll, they'll be allowed to come out of the houses. My yeah. in-laws are like that; they're frightened to death of sitting outside the front door. I can't wait to get on a plane. So I think you've got people at different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think safety. How I can keep safe, and how we can get people through airports. That'll be the next challenge: getting people through airports safely, and how they manage that uh, will be interesting. Yeah. Um, I think the quarantine for some, I'll be honest, if people are furloughed or working from home anyway, for me, I'm going. What's the difference? Yeah. I'll come back and I'll be, I'm, I've been locked in for 10 weeks anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's subject to uh, our CEO being okay. I work from home for two weeks on yeah. the way back because the kids are off school. So it works for me in terms of my, yeah. my dates. So I don't think the quarantine will put absolutely everybody off. What it's going to put off is the airlines flying because they don't think there's going to be a demand for it. Right. Um, so do I think we'll have a late summer? I'm hoping so. And we are seeing people booking. And I think we are seeing people booking because they're thinking, well, it's a good deal. And if I can't travel, you'll give me my money back anyway. So why not? Yeah. So we are seeing a bit of that. We are seeing more for winter. Okay. And we are, see we are seeing a lot has been kicked into next year. So a lot of people that are adamant, even if the quarantine is lifted, even if we can travel, a lot of move to next um, summer um, already. But I do I do think we'll see a late summer season and we are seeing green shoots and we're seeing inquiries, which so people are sick of the four walls. Mm. And if I can, how much is it going to be? That's what we're seeing now. So yeah. and there's some good deals out there. There's some really yeah. good deals in market. And good to see the appetite is there as well. Yeah. Is, is that what you're seeing as well with your members? Yeah, really, really similar. So we, we know that there's pent up demand. We, we did a survey recently, which got over 4,000 respondents and um, two thirds of those said, you know, as and when restrictions are lifted, they, their appetite to travel hasn't changed. Uh, we know different demographics feel very differently about travel. Um, so yeah, so I absolutely agree with what Kirsten talked about. Um, you know, there, there is still hope, isn't there? There is still hope that we can get a summer in at some point. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't think we can write off the summer. I think late summer, early early autumn. Um, but next next year is is looking good already. So I think there's um, you know for next year for those book, those rebookings, but also new bookings coming through. Um, and consume, we we need consumers to book early because obviously we don't control the pricing. The operators and airlines do. Um, and the prices, I think, inevitably we are seeing it already have have increased. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to go away in August right now or September, prices are phenomenal. So. Um, you know, we, where we are the prices where are the prices increasing is that for next year? Next year, yeah, yeah, next year, yeah. Not we haven't seen it price increases for this year, just just for next year. So, um, so I think the, the appetite is there. There's definitely pent up demand, um, and yeah, you know, let's you know, fingers crossed. If um, if we can get the air bridges in, FCO, FCO advice changes, um, quarantine measures, you know, they they come to an end, say 29th of June. Um, which is the next three week window, then um, we can still get a bit of a summer through. Yes. Yeah, here's hoping. And Stephen, I mean, obviously you've got a huge array of members that are part of the yeah. entity, but are they, yeah. are they seeing similar kinds of green shoots? Yeah. Is there optimism there? Yes, they are. I, I said at the outset that we are an optimistic lot, and I do think it will get back to normal. I mean, seeing friends and family is apparently the, the number one priority for most people after mm -hmm. lockdown. And then second is eating out. But third, uh, and I think something like 38%, is actually uh, going on holiday. So there is a huge pent-up demand there. There's no doubt about that. But we can't be complacent. We need to get this government to listen and say that, look, if quarantine was going to be uh, imposed, you should have done it 12 weeks ago, not now. Because I, 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 I hear what Kirsten is saying, and there will be people on furlough that, for whom it won't be a problem. But if you're employed, you know, who's going to book a, I, I don't know, a weekend to Paris and then have to take two weeks off work afterwards or go on a, a, a two-week holiday and ask their boss for a month off? It's just going to be a huge impediment. So we absolutely, absolutely need to press this government to change this stupid quarantine rule. 
Yeah, agreed. And I mean, obviously, this is Wednesday, there are discussions going on in the House of Commons today, and he's hoping that the government sees sense. To me, it seems like more of a desperate plea from a, from a desperate government. To try Absolutely. And it's, a, it's a distraction, I think. It's a distraction from their failing uh, because everything else is, uh, you know, they're tinkering at the edges. They've got no confidence. Their track and trace thing is, uh, is, is currently not working. So, yeah, it's a distraction. Yeah. I mean, just, just on that, I mean, I think, you know, quarantine is not, you know, the quarantine measures are coming in on Monday. Yeah, that's that's not that's not changing. I think what's really important now is that there, there are a number of industry organisations out there. I are to buy UK working really hard. Airlines UK as well working really hard um, in talking to government in the future, um, future aviation groups that are, that are out there. Um, and I think it's really important that we ensure that as an industry we are we are united and that we are working together on some of these common issues, not on everything, but on these common issues, mm -hmm. and make it's understood we know we know that it's very difficult to speak with one voice we know that we're very fragmented we know however that this is catastrophic you know this is absolutely catastrophic it continues to be catastrophic in the industry so we've got to make sure that we're all speaking as loud as possible to get the voice heard because because we know it's not easy to do and so um, the, best way, the best way to do that is to write to your mp would you say but I mean, absolutely write to the MP, write to the Home Office, Foreign Secretary, I think I think you just have to write to you know, whoever you can, um, but actually join forces so that there is a number of organisations that have come together, um, as we talked about before, um, and, and just shout, shout as loud as you can. Um, but I th yeah, I think it's just really important that we, we don't give up on that um, mm. and we keep pursuing alternatives. So let's not just Let's not just shout for the sake of shouting. Let's pursue the alternatives because at the end of the day, we are an industry that's built on health and safety. That's always paramount. That's always priority in everything we do. Um, and, you know, we're, we're a world-class industry and we need to maintain that. And, um, yeah, we, we need to find a way of making sure that government do hear us and they do, um, they do support the industry and understand the value that it delivers. Well, here's here to that. I think that's a, that's a perfect note to end on. So thank you very much to all three of you. And we are now going to move to the live Q&A. So thank you very much. Hi again. Uh, just while our panellists uh, join us for the live Q&A part, we are going to be looking at our last poll of the afternoon, uh, which will shortly be appearing on the screen. Uh, and it's just asking you, really, what do you think? So the title of today's seminar is Can the Summer Season Be Saved? How optimistic are you feeling, uh, particularly having heard the discussion this afternoon and of course with the quarantine measures confirmed by government yesterday and us knowing that we're not going to have any real change to that for the next three weeks. Uh, how positive are you feeling? I can see the numbers are going up. Uh, I'll, I'll share the results of that shortly. Uh, Stephen is joining us as is Kirsten and Julia should be joining us shortly too. Um, just a reminder, I've seen some questions appearing in the chat function. Um, just a reminder, please do use the Q&A function uh, for your questions. Um, I am conscious that we are slightly running over, apologies for that, but I do want to make sure that we answer uh, some of the questions that have been addressed. So uh, apologies for that, but we'll, we'll just spend another 10 minutes just answering some of these questions and then sharing the poll results. Uh, Hi Stephen, hi Kirsten, uh, Julia should be joining us shortly. Um, I'm going to rattle through some of these questions that have come through if that's alright. Uh, we've got a question here um, saying that there's been a, there hasn't been actually a lot of publicity this time about consumers who, who've been burnt doing DIY holidays during COVID-19. Have you Kirsten and, and Julia, have you seen um, perhaps more bookings from people who previously had done DIY holidays, holiday bookings, uh, who now want to book with a financially protected agency and tour operator because they've been burnt. Um, you know, might we now see people finally realising that DIY holidays aren't really the answer? I, I personally think it's less about them being burnt. I think the fact they couldn't get hold of people. And we've, we've picked up a lot probably from social media, our travel counsellors on social media, where people were probably ranting more about not being able to get through or get hold of people. And they've helped people and supported people that weren't our bookings. So I, I think it's right. I don't think we've seen a lot of people being burnt in terms of losing money necessarily. And it's probably a lot of chargebacking, chargeback been going on from a consumer perspective. But I do think we have picked up customers who now appreciate having somebody at the end of the phone to speak to in a, in a crisis. So I think that there'll be a slight change in that going forward, hopefully. So people to travel agents? To travel agents, yes. I think. You know, in a crisis like this, you value a travel agent, I think, more than you would have done previously and been able to get some support in, in a crisis. So, yeah, I do think, hopefully, people will now value it more than they did previously. 
Julia, have your members been saying the same? Have they been contacted by customers who might have been burnt or impacted by not being able to get hold of anybody? Yeah, I, I think what Kirsten said, I, I think what, uh, what this has done is demonstrated the benefit of, of speaking to a human and being able to get hold of one as well. Um, you know, your local agent is there, you know, you know where they are, you can get hold of them. Um, and that has, that has really helped um, a lot of our members and the agents maintain that relationship with their customers. Um, and we've all heard those horror stories of, of many customers who have had their fingers burnt, um, but where they have booked through organisations, you know, for, for you know, for whatever reason, booked through those organisations and just not been able to get hold of anybody. I think that's that's what's going to, I believe, um, get the consumers rethinking of who they book with. OK, um, we've got a comment here on your point, Stephen, just about networking, actually, uh, from Brian Cook, who's saying that, um, in his 50 years, it always has it and will do in terms of the industry bouncing back. He says he was sadly deeply involved in the immediate after effects of the London tube bombings in 2005 when people said tube usage would never return to pre-level, and it did within weeks. He said equally, uh, he thinks that face-to-face -face will return because after the Icelandic volcano, I'm never going to pronounce that, uh, issue, <laughs> <laughs> that, that everybody predicted then that it'd be a huge rise in teleconferencing and business travel would stagnate. Did it? He says no. So Stephen, I think he's kind of echoing the points that you were making, that people perhaps have these grand visions of society changing and things changing, but actually it probably won't. Does no, I agree. I, I agree with Brian. In fact, before I came on air, uh, I made a list of the, of the, and it is a long list of the disasters that we've uh, endured in this industry. The first I remember was a thing called stabilizer and the removal of stabilizer, which was basically retail price maintenance. And everybody said when retail price maintenance goes and discounting can be uh, uh, introduced, that it'll be the end of the travel agent. Not so. Then we saw the court line collapse, the, uh, the arrival of direct cell operators, the intersun collapse, SARS, <laughs> bird flu, Two Iraq wars, ash clouds, as you say, tsunamis, uh, financial crashes, and terrorism in, as Brian mentioned, in London, in Brussels, Paris, Tunisia, Egypt, Nice, Madrid, and within weeks we're back to normal. So I think the public, thank God, has a short memory and a huge desire to, uh, to go on holiday. Okay, well, here, here to that. Uh, there's a comment here from Julie Franklin just on this point, though, um, raising actually a really valid point saying that, you know, on this networking relationship side, I'm interested to gauge opinion on rep visits moving forward. Of course, that's probably going to be a challenge, especially for smaller agencies who are limited to having a certain number of people in their store. Um, Julie, it's probably one more for, for you, but what do you, how do you envisage that's going to work going forward? I think inevitably short term there will be an impact you know if you're if you're following the guidelines that have been set by the government then you you do need to um, make sure you've got those safety measures in place um, I think I think we're all going to be very cautious um, so I think short term we'll see an impact um, and I mean personally I you know I can only be honest and speak from personal opinion um, it's not something I would be encouraging short term um, you know, we've got an office and I, I wouldn't necessarily be encouraging visitors in their short term. I think long term we have to work with the guidelines and make sure that we are keeping our staff safe, um, first of all, and our consumers safe. So I think it's one that we are going to have to manage and um, look at the guidelines as they come through. But I think I think we, we all just have to be cautious and sensible with it. Actually, as we speak, we've had a breaking news come through that Grant Shapps has confirmed that uh, wearing face coverings on public transport is to be compulsory in England uh, from the 15th of June. So it might be that we see masks just become a part of our, our daily norm and we could see everybody in shops wearing masks and that might make agents feel reassured if reps are coming in, but also customers feel, re feel reassured if they're booking. Um, it's going to be quite a big change. Um, any comments to make on that? I mean, we've, we spoke earlier about how face masks are going to again become part of the norm to reassure people, but perhaps if they're part of a norm in society, it won't put people off. It won't make people wary of going to the airport if they're going to have to wear a face mask. Yeah. I mean, again, I'll, maybe I'll take this first. First, I mean, personally, I, I think it, for me, again, speaking personally, we all have to feel comfortable. And this is about making, helping consumers feel comfortable, staff feel comfortable. Um, and actually, if, face masks do that and if face masks protect us then I personally think it's the right approach I, I go sh I go shopping with a face mask um, and ever and have done ever since this pandemic um, and wouldn't feel comfortable today not to go shopping without that so for me it's become part of my normal routine um, but that's a personal opinion and I think it's it, it you you have to follow the guidelines and obviously in this case it's going to be compulsory anyhow um, but actually you want to feel com com comfortable and safe as well Okay. Yeah, I'm so. 
I'm sorry, Sophie. I, 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 I too. I feel I feel the same as Julia. When I go to the supermarket, yeah, I wear a I, I wear a mask. But as as we said in our earlier discussion, I think we need we need protocols across the world. We need protocols for airlines, airports, hotels, so that we're all singing from the same song sheet. So that we don't get a situation where in some airports you need uh, face masks, and mm -hmm. some airports are taking temperature tests, and you might pass one end and fail the next end, the other end. It's uh, it, it's something that we need as an industry to. Uh, to encourage government to be pressing for for worldwide protocols but you know it's interesting we, we we're beating ourselves up in terms of uh, 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 this quarantine but uh, I, I, I read uh, this morning that there were more deaths here in the UK than in the whole of Europe combined more COVID deaths oh my in the UK the, yesterday than in the whole of Europe combined so it's just an, an astonishing statistic, isn't it? You know, um, so it's ironic that we should be closing down as opposed to uh, the other way around. Yeah. The other, the other. I, I also had a tweet, and forgot, forgive me for this, but the UK has the highest R number in Europe, which means that if a person goes abroad for two weeks, upon their return, they have a lower chance of being C19 positive than if they'd holidayed at home. It's safer to go abroad than it is to stay at home. Yeah, well, I mean, tell that to the government. <laughs> on, on this point about government, actually, um, Kate Ken was raised uh, quite an interesting point about obviously the, the huge number of jobs that will be impacted um, across the travel industry in the next two months, particularly. She says, so how do we make government know just how many in total will be affected? Because that's the challenge, isn't it? That government just doesn't seem to understand the seriousness of the situation facing the sector. She says, and God knows how we do this, but she said, can we get a tally from the whole industry on expected redundancies? Well, we, we, we sorry, the, 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 the Tourism Alliance has already published some, some figures. I mean, ah, okay. we, we understand that half the industry currently has been furloughed, half the uh, travel and tourism industry uh, in this country has been furloughed uh, and in a recent poll by the Tourism Alliance two-thirds of those uh, who've been furloughed two-thirds of them may well be facing redundancy so that's 1.3 million people that are uh, insecure and in a, a, a very bad place at the moment and uh, the, the, the government knows this uh, Sophie um, we are as ITT also pressing the case very strongly that it, uh, these, uh, these uh, recent uh, quarantine impositions are having a profound effect and could potentially cost millions of jobs. But the, sec the government just isn't listening, it seems. Well, no, there are, there's certainly no positive response at the moment. Mm. On a more positive side, we've got some questions asking more about the green shoots that are emerging and the bookings that are emerging. Um, Kirsten, we've got questions about what trends we're seeing. So someone said, for example, are we worried that we're going to see less of a family market this year because of the financial pressures as a result of, of COVID-19? Are you able to tell us a little bit about any trends that you've seen from bookings? Is a family still booking or is it more about couples or...? No, we're, we're actually seeing both, if, if I'm honest. Um, I think obviously this, this time of year would generally be a late family market. Mm -hmm. um, now that's what that's campaigns we will be running. We are seeing um, we're seeing high end customers, couples, uh, mm -hmm. where it's great value for money for the summer booking. But we are still seeing quite a big number of family holidays because it is good value. But this yeah, for this yeah for august and september oh. so we are still seeing late bookings um now it's not a huge amount mm -hmm. but I, we are starting to see more and, and interesting in the last two weeks we've seen a significant amount more of inquiries for this summer so i think although there's there's you can take the news two ways i think yesterday the announcement um that, that came out um quite late yesterday by, by pretty i think a lot of people were really disappointed but i actually wasn't surprised they were not going to back down on on the announcement yesterday no. so however the fact that we know it's three weeks we know there'll be a secondary announcement we know they're under some pressure um i actually think people are feeling a bit more positive six weeks ago they were saying there wouldn't be a summer the summer was a write-off yeah life had just changed so i do think people are um more positive about it so and destination wise, what are we seeing? Is it, is it mainly Europe? Is it, are we seeing long haul? We are seeing predominantly uh, med. Okay. Because um, I think that's what's being talked about, isn't it? That, that's mm -hmm. where the, the air bridges are really probably more prevalent. So the late bookings we're currently seeing are med predominantly. And which countries in particular? Is there a sense that people are put off destinations like Italy, which obviously suffered so devastatingly from, from the coronavirus crisis? Or are people moving on from that? I, I think people have short memories. Uh, but I, I, I 
I'll be honest, it's not Italy we've seen a lot of. Okay. It is Greece and Spain that we've seen the majority of. Spain's um, called Stafford, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what we would expect at this time of year anyway. So, um, yeah. Can I just go back to a point you asked at the beginning about uh, reps? Because yeah. I think that's, that's really important. I think that's where we can get creative as an industry. You know, we talked about Zoom earlier. Now, we, we obviously have our own TCTV studio where we, we, we showcase, um, I guess, different products and, and different people. I think there will be a way for communicating on Zoom, for example, with, with suppliers out to the industry, which won't mean people have to go into shops. And it's probably a bit more efficient and effective um, and saves a lot of money. So yeah. I think there's other ways that we can get a bit creative um, in terms of how, how the industry starts to re-communicate with both customers and, and agents. And that's something the industry has always been able to do is move quickly and innovate, isn't it? So right. some of the best some of the best businesses in this industry have come out of recessions or adversity. Yeah. And it, it is how imaginative and how creative you can be. Our business was built on imagination and creativity from you know a, a guy that didn't have a lot of money at the time. So I think some of the best ideas actually come out of some of the worst crises. So it'll be interesting to see what does come out of um, this and you know I, I thought the businesses that do survive this and there will be a lot of businesses that survive it sadly there will be some businesses that I think we do lose along the way yeah. but I do believe the ones that come through it have shown the resilience through a really difficult time and will come out leaner stronger and hopefully better for the future that's a good note to end on. Just before we say goodbye, uh, I don't know if you guys can see the poll on the screen. Uh, I'm just about to share the results, but how would each of you vote? Can the summer season be saved? Yes or no? Yes. Like yes. it, Stephen? Julia, Julia says yes. Yes. Stephen? Oh, I've got to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, just to share the results, uh, overwhelmingly actually, which is really heartening to see, 71% uh, said yes, that's 94 people said yes, as long as the government of course scraps its quarantine measures and SEO advice is lifted, yes. if that doesn't happen, nobody's going anywhere. Um, and 29% said no, the damage has already been done and Brits will be too wary to travel. So I think, I think it's good to see that there's still positivity and fantastic to see that there's green shoots and that people are booking already. Uh, thank you very much to, to all three of you uh, for your time this afternoon, I really do appreciate that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and thank you to all of you uh, for attending again today. Uh, we've had a fantastic turnout and it, it's, it's great to see such positivity uh, at the end of this afternoon as well. Uh, a huge thank you too to all of our panellists. Um, I hope all of you have found today to be insightful. Um, and it was really heartening to hear, like we said, those grounds for optimism. It's a trend as well, that I should say, that we've also been seeing in our weekly TTG travel agent tracker as well. So. We'll keep reporting on that. Um, please do keep getting in touch and let us know what else we can be doing to help you and your business. Uh, we will be sending out a survey as we always do after today's session. So please do let us know what else you would like us to focus on in future. And don't forget too that our Coronavirus Business Support Forum is also available on our website with our panel of experts who are always ready to answer your questions. Um, just a reminder that to help us continue providing online content such as this, uh, we are asking delegates today to consider making a donation to have attended today's event. 20% uh, of all contributions go to NHS charities together. Uh, please do visit ttgmedia.com forward slash contribution. And a huge, huge thank you to all of those of you who have done that already. Um, thank you again to all of you, to our panellists. Uh, don't forget to check back on ttgmedia.com tomorrow uh, where all of today's sessions will be appearing. We split them up into bite-sized chunks so you can view each session individually. Um, continue to stay safe, stay well and stay tuned to TTG for all of your latest travel industry news and business support. Thank you very much everybody.